man, it's fucked. The war, the whole war on drugs is fucked up. And so for you, you were just focusing on ecstasy, huh? Well, ecstasy was my primary product and what I got my reputation for. But when you branch out to have 200 people working for you, you start to become like a, these, these outlets became like one-stop shops for various club drugs, ketamine. I had my own LSD chemist. We were getting crystals from the Rainbow family in San Fran. Um, various Mexican pharmaceuticals, Xanax, uh, Valiums, Somas, um, GHB. But yeah, I mean, the ecstasy was the bulk of it. It's a crazy thing. Like we're we're in a process now. We might see MDMA legalized within the next two three years in North America. Well, I think it's made me more empathogenic. I almost got beat to death by some drunks when I was a teenager, mm. and I wouldn't go out and dance. Wouldn't talk to women. I was too self conscious. And when the rave scene began, I took ecstasy. Couldn't stop dancing. Couldn't <laughs> stop talking to people all night long. And for yeah. over ten years, I was in that mindset. But you know, you just sit sit down with people and and you you, you open your hearts and tell each other your life stories. Even the New Mexican Mafia. I told you that every time I went over there, it was it was lethal atmosphere, and they, they looked like they want to eat me. Except mm. for the one night they said, we're going to have an ecstasy party tonight. Our women are coming over. Most of us are doing it for the first time. I, I brought them the pills, get a call in the middle of the night. We've run out, bring some more pills, brought some more pills over. And they're all over there like these sweaty overgrown teddy bears smiling away picking me up bear hugging me england man we love your pills telling me their life stories so yeah it it, it does it, it breaks down those barriers yeah for me personally for me like ecstasy or mdma it's been my personal choice of anything and do you think that's made you like more feeling towards people uh like i've been in the psychedelic scene for a long time uh, I used to pop ecstasy when I was young like crazy, like double stack, triple stack, Mercedes, you name it. I was in the grave scene long fucking time. I was Mitsub raving before. Mitsubishi. Oh, yeah. Mitsubishi, white Mercedes, blue telephone, double st single yeah. stacks, double stack, the whole nine yards. Where were you raving at? Fuck Toronto, man. We had a huge rave scene. Oh, I imagine you must have had a massive scene in Toronto. Massive, massive. Like the 90s, like uh, mid-90s, even like early 2000s. It was... Uh, crazy way before the whole like uh electronic music festival that you see today it was like real raves raves yeah but for me me currently i do mdma therapy like pure 100 percent guided facilitated mdma therapy you do that presently yeah yeah i do everything uh, mdma uh ibogaine um psilocybin like full and, on. and what's the legality of that in toronto so ketamine is legal in facilitated uh, uh, medical establishments. There's lobby groups right now where we might even see within the next 18 months that MDMA is actually MDMA psilocybin is already sanctioned for research in certain laboratories here. Uh, we're part of the super cluster. So UFT is researching all these uh, MDMA is not a, psych a psychedelic, but I'll just group it in there for the sake of the conversation. We could potentially see within under two years, MDMA psilocybin be completely decriminalized and then put in a category of um, use with medical treatment. Yeah, I think all drugs should be completely legalized and decriminalized. Yeah, and but then, then there's no, then there's no the, business. End the, end the war on drugs. <laughs> people who want the drugs to be kept illegal are the gangsters and the people chasing the gangsters because like you said, it's big business. I always say if you want to like if you want to make things better in North America, specifically with the cartels in Mexico, legalize everything. Better the whole world, man. Everything from knife crime in London to Juarez being the murder capital. A lot of that revolves around gangsters competing for that black market profit. And I learned this writing about Escobar. I've written several books about Escobar. I'm writing the longest book ever about him presently, it's, it's over a thousand pages long, Pablo Escobar's story, two, the first two installments are out, but he could get coca paste for $60 a kilo in the 70s when he was starting out, and because of drug laws, cocaine was going for 60,000 a kilo. Jesus. So making worthless plants illegal has made those worthless plants more valuable than gold, and it's mm -hmm. been the biggest profit opportunity in the history of the world for criminal organizations. Yeah, I, I was reading a fascinating uh, D 
deep dive study in Mexico where the cartels have taken over avocado plantations because the profits for avocados are uh, better than some other forms of drugs, which is it's, it's interesting. But yeah, you're right. I think it's an epidemic. Uh, you know, what I mean by epidemic is it's funny because uh, at least for Ontario, so where the province I'm from, by by the scripts written by doctors, and so this is all documented, uh, we have one third of Ontarians who are prescribed some form of opioids, so oxycodines, et cetera. Now that's one third of the population is on a script, but you can take something like CBD or you can take psilocybin or you can take hemp or you can take any of these non-addictive two, three time use and you're completely alleviated of your pain. But the problem with that is it's not a sustainable business model. Like opioids are highly addictive. You got to buy them every single month. So it's like the writing's on the wall, man. People have to say, it's always funny when people tell me, it's like, oh, are you taking a drug? I'm like, no, motherfucker. What do you think you're popping? You're popping. You think your Advil and Tylenol every day is healthy? You think your fucking oxycodine's healthy? Or you must be fucking delusional. Like, I mean, at the peak of the war on drugs, you had hundreds of thousands of potheads going to prison. What gives the right of people who are popping all those pills you just mentioned and smoking tobacco and drinking alcohol, what gives those people the right to put hundreds of thousands of people in prison yeah. for cho choosing weed? That is moral relativism. That is not what the prison system was designed for. I'm a member of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. They're cops, and they say, look, we joined to put away the bad guys. And if you look how crime has been defined for millennia, person A harms person B, murder, robbery, rape, drug traffickers like me, not making excuses for. But if you put hundreds of thousands of people in prison for weed possession, who's a person with weed hurting? Yeah. Th th themselves, possibly, but that that's the most. So, yeah, it's just the whole thing is a big shakedown on the taxpayers. And you are right, the floodgate is open because these evil fucking politicians that have kept drugs like cannabis illegal. I'm not talking smoking. I'm talking the oils. These kids that have had these cancer um, seizures and going to comas and they can die. And all the kids who've died and all the people with cancer have died because the fucking evil politicians have kept this illegal. They can't go up against those babies anymore like Charlotte in America. A politician will not go up against a sick baby because they will lose votes. So the floodgate has opened and people are waking up all over the world. Queen Victoria's doctor said this is the most medicinal plant on the face of the earth. And the earliest laws against cannabis were the pharmaceutical societies of California. They wanted it to be made illegal so people could not grow free medicine in their own backyards. Yeah, Canada used to be, before World War I, the biggest producer of hemp because we have good weather for it and it's versatile. Then during the wartime efforts of World War I, World War II, they started growing rapeseed, which is canola oil, which stands for Canada oil. And so the big pharmaceutical companies came in. Well, let me rewind. Before pharmaceutical companies, there were, there were um, chemical companies. Then they went into pharmacy, right? So they, they provided all these oils and materials for wartime efforts. And then they made it illegal for hemp to be grown in Canada. Like think about it, a native type of, well, it's not native, but native, planted natively there. Uh, you can't overdose from it, has so many benefits. You can use it as biodiesel, you can use it as CBD, you can you can get hemp strains and then make clothing out of hemp. There's like multitude, multi-variable usages of hemp. No, 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 that's illegal. It's illegal. You can't, Henry, you can't plant it, that's illegal. Henry, Henry Ford made a car out of it. Yeah. And he said, why are we depleting the world's resources when we've got, we, we can just grow these plants and replace them? Yeah. And the whole world economy was hijacked by Harry Anslinger and his gang, William Randolph Hearst and, that, and, and the DuPonts. And that's shaped the whole world, that decision, because Harry Anslinger said to everybody around the world, all the different countries, if you don't sign on for these drug laws, America's not going to trade with you. And Harry Anslinger was the uh, future uh, son-in-law of um, the Undersecretary of the U.S. Treasury, um, Mellon. And Mellon had investments in fledgling pharma, petrochemicals, mm -hmm. all these other industries. So it was just one big 
corporate cabal that stopped it. But now, like you said, the hemp, there's, there's so many applications for hemp. Yeah. I was in I was in Holland uh, towards the end of last year and I went to the hemp museum. I'm thinking about writing a book called The War Against Weed. So I was doing some research and everything I saw in there just, just tied right in with what I'd, I'd been finding out on the internet. But you're right, tides are turning. Like here in Canada, I think we're the second country after Uruguay, I believe, that we fully uh, legalized marijuana. So you can grow your own, I think like three, four plants you can grow. Uh, there's stories everywhere. There's obviously pros and cons for this. Uh, but like Portugal is a good example where they decriminalized all the drugs and 70% drop within, uh, within I think it was uh, murder rate, suicide, uh, the prison system. Went, everything got better by just decriminalizing the drugs. Well, that program started in my hometown, Witness. And really? What they, yeah, what, what they did was heroin use was off the scale, shoplifting, car theft, burglaries, disease transmission from dirty needles, AIDS. So they said, all right, let's just give these guys, you know, medicinal grade heroin. It's a worthless plant. It's not going to cost the taxpayers that money to source mm. this. And that's what they did. And the usage went down because the users weren't afraid of getting arrested. They spoke to the health teams. Like Portugal got their users down from over 100,000 by counseling them to, to less than 50,000. Yeah. And then all the crime collapsed. The, sh the shops were so happy that they were going to roll it out across the country. Mm. And America found out, the DEA found out, the White House found out, and one call to our prime minister, and that program got shut down. But really? Por wow. Portugal, it was Portugal that picked it up years later, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Canada might follow Portugal. Like, uh, you know, we're we're leading the scene in the psychedelic therapy, especially in Vancouver. We have an area called East Hastings, which is like they have safe zones, so you can shoot up in this, like exactly how you mentioned. Good. And uh, especially Ibogaine. Like Ibogaine has shown, and we've been studying Ibogaine for a long time, where two treatments of Ibogaine for heroin addicts um, – has been has been shown that I think around seventy seven percent of people within that study uh, got clean after this two two treatments of ibogaine. Wow, that's phenomenal! Think about that. Just two treatments, and you're not addicted to heroin anymore. 